Okay, to talk, up, to, talk to us about uh, the new economy, we have Yuri Sutar. He is the head of the digital asset array at Economy. Hello, everyone, also from my side. So, as already mentioned, so I come from a company called Economy. Has anyone heard about it, maybe? Yeah? Okay, quite a few, nice. Um, so today, what I'm going to try to explain you is basically what we do and how we approach digital asset management industry, because it's something totally new. And uh, I'm going to talk about the challenges that we are facing as a company working in this space. So first of all, like how we started. The idea about economy uh, was kind of born when, you know, the founders, the team and Yanni uh, got involved in cr with crypto. And I'm sure all of you guys have probably the same experiences in case you have some knowledge, you know. Uh, the same was with me. So when I got involved with crypto, everyone was asking me, like, which coin should I buy? You know, friends, relatives, what, where should I invest in? And um, there's no simple answer. Because in case you start explaining to them what should they do, you need to help them open their wallet, create an account on the exchange. Then they're going to call you every two weeks um, to get the information about the latest, hottest coin. Then you're going to need to help them transfer the assets. So just very complex thing. And I started doing that. So I helped one friend. I helped two friends, three. You know, all of a sudden, I was just managing other people's money. So the same thing happened to Yanni and Tim. Uh, who are the founders behind this idea. And what they realize is it would be very good to have basically a platform that can help you do that. So basically manage money for other people. So um, that idea was born in 2016. So we had ICO in September of 2016. That was one of the first ICOs uh, in Europe. So we raised 10.6 million at that time, which was incredible. So basically, if you think about those times, those were the times when Ether was $10, you know. I mean, a little bit different times than right now, because right now raising 10 million maybe is not that incredible, but in terms of the capital raised at that time, it was, I believe, sixth largest ICO in the whole year. So soon after that, we started building the product, and we were one of the first companies, first ICOs that actually delivered that. So later on in 2016, um, no, um, I'm sorry, in 2018, no, 17. <laughs> so ICO 16, 17, August, so within less than a year, let's say 10 months, we delivered the product and we opened the platform. So there was at first just one digital asset array, that's how we call it, a basket of different digital assets managed by a professional, so managed by Columbus Capital in this case, and people who have no knowledge about crypto could invest in it. So they would just throw in money and relax, sit back, you know, they don't even need to take a look at it, and they're managing assets for them. So that's how it all started. And then later on, we started adding new DA managers, so digital asset array managers, and um, getting feedbacks. So with the vision to basically cl create a platform where anyone, as I said before on the panel, a student from his dorm room can basically manage assets. And we already achieved that, basically. So we have one student right now. He's in uh, Czech Republic, and he's managing, I think, $300,000. It's not a big money, but for a student like him, it's pretty good. Um, and yeah, if we move on, so that just like our vision to build a bridge between all the new economy. And um, that's a little bit information about our company. So ICO, what we are managing right now, so $163,000, no, million, million dollars. Um, but of course it's varying because we are dealing with crypto, you know. So it used to be like 300, then it's dropping, then it's 200 again. So it's a very dynamic uh, place. And also our assets, luckily, so we raised 10.6 million, and luckily we kept most of it in crypto assets. So some of the companies that we're seeing right now, so in Slovenia recently, there was one ICO, and what they raised, I think 10 million, so approximately the same amount of money that we raised. And what they did, they bought immediately office for 2 million. 
You know, if we would do that, well, <laughs> today we probably wouldn't have much money left. But what we did, we were just renting office up until like two months ago. And um, those assets appreciated in value. So at the end of last year, this was worth 320 million. So right now, um, we have enough capital to basically support our operations and also our revenues are luckily big enough to support day-to-day -day operations. So uh, we have platform with like 60,000 users almost, and they come from 63 countries, and we have 30 managers. And right now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the platform, so what are the pillars, and then what are the challenges, because I think that's what's gonna be the most interesting for you guys. Um, so basically our platform has four functions. So first of all, we create a DEA, so um, we do all the reporting, the accounting, the, the creation process, everything. Then the second thing we do is basically um, we store the assets, so we are the custodian, because I'm not sure if you guys would trust a guy who's in his dorm room in Czech Republic with your money and that he's holding your private keys. Probably that wouldn't be the case. Would anyone invest? No? Me neither. <laughs> so, that's the reason why we're doing that. And also we have capital and we can afford developing a proper solutions. And then the, the next thing is execution of trades. So when you're dealing with large amounts of money, you need to have a trading engine. And we're providing that. So there's no one basically sitting in front of computer transferring the assets to the exchange and trading them you know, manually. That's not happening. And then the fourth one, which is still not fully developed, is Fiat Trampa. So we're gonna basically enable users to enter crypto market with fiat, because right now that's not the case. So right now if you wanna invest, you need to register on our platform, then go to some exchange, buy crypto assets first, so either Bitcoin or Ether, transfer that to our platform, and then invest into those baskets of digital um, assets. So those are the four pillars. And right now I'm gonna go one by one, um, touch on them, a little bit more into details and explain you about the challenges that we are facing in this industry and how this might evolve in the future. So first of all, um, backend fund administration. So here, one of the challenges we had was that, you know, how to gain trust. Like, you have money on your platform. You display what are the assets of the people, but then how do they know that that's real? You know, like, What's stopping us basically that we display you, you have 10 Bitcoin worth of money or $100,000 worth of money on our platform, but we basically stole your assets. What's stopping us? Basically nothing, like we could do that. So we're thinking how to basically uh, be fully transparent, how to gain trust from the users. And what we figure out is that we need an audit. So basically we need a big four company to audit our, let's say, wallets and confirm that the assets are really there. And it seems simple and pretty straightforward. We all know what we wanted. But then the challenge is that since we're dealing with a new industry, the conversation you're having with the auditor is very, very difficult. So we approached Delight. It was, I think it was November or December last year. And uh, we presented them the idea and what we want to do. You know, we said we want to be fully transparent. Like, guys, could you audit our company? And uh, guess what their reaction was? We never done something like that. We don't know how to do it. So they said, okay, we're gonna call other offices. So we're in communication with Deloitte Slovenia. They said, we're gonna call office in Japan. You know, Japan is really advanced when it comes to crypto. Maybe they have some solutions. They called the office in Japan. They're like, yeah, we're developing something, but we are not really there. They called Amsterdam office. So in Amsterdam, they're also the crypto scene is pretty big. And um, the Amsterdam office didn't have the solution. So then they're like, well, what should we do? Let's just develop it ourselves. And basically the innovation lab of Delight developed the solution. So we figure out what's gonna be the process, uh, how they're gonna audit how we're gonna confirm basically, because we could also give to Deloitte just random wallets and we could say, oh, that's, that's the wallet from our, you know, from our platform and we could basically lie. So they needed to confirm that we really own those wallets, we have access to them, we're making the transactions, you know, like approving. So the process was pretty complicated because Deloitte never did something like that. 
and um, they confirmed that all the assets are really there. So we made public release of the, their statement like two weeks ago. So it was the first audit. But just to like explain you what are the challenges, you know, so like you want to do things right, you want to be fully transparent, but the industry, other industries, they're just not catching up. And um, then if you move to cold storage, so the same is with custody. You want to have a proper custody and like a, let's say, respectful custodian, but no one is doing that. I mean, at least not for all the assets, because there's, as I said before on a panel, 1,500 cryptocurrencies or even more right now. And we're supporting 60 on our platform at the moment. So developing cold storage solution for all those assets, it's pretty tricky. So what we did here, we basically developed our own cold storage solution. You know, because uh, we wanted to have cold storage solution in multiple layers and um, have multi-signature wallet so that there need to be multiple people signing the transaction to approve them, to approve the transaction, because in case you put the assets on a ledger, a single employee could steal them. And you don't want that. Because for a platform like us, we're done probably with this business if someone hacks us, you know. So you really need to be careful. And again, there is no solution on the market, so we started building it ourselves. It's a still, you know, a process because um, you kind of need to, when it comes to that, you need to juggle your priorities. So you have, on one hand, you have DA managers and users who want all the assets supported on our platform. I'm getting emails literally daily. Even today in the morning, I got email from one of our managers. He's like, when are you adding Neo to your platform? And when are you adding one chain? And you know, the tricky part is that those assets are their separate chains. So it's not easy to store them. They might have a decent volume. They might have be listed on the exchanges where we're trading, but adding them requires a lot, a lot of work. So you have that on one hand, and on the other hand, you you have the security. So of course we could add them, but we what we need, we would need to do is keep them on the exchanges, and that's something you don't want to do. So you kind of need to balance that out. And then when it comes to trading and um, execution of trades, here again a few challenges. One of the challenges we are facing right now is liquidity. So last year it was kind of okay. Um, decent volume on the exchanges, but right now, if you take a look at the market, it's getting better, but in January or February, the market was literally dead. So um, the second thing is that the coins, so the ICOs, you know, when they're hitting exchange, there's hype at the beginning, everything is skyrocketing, a lot of volume. You know, we add the coin to our platform because everyone wants it, but two months later, guess what? No one is trading it. So we had that case with District OX, DNT. So we added it to, the, our, to our platform in uh, August last year, and in January this year, so at that time the trading volume was like 2 million, 24-hour um, um, trading volume. And uh, in January it was just $75,000. And we're managing 165 million, let's say. So how are you gonna fit the orders, let's say if one manager wants to put one or 2% into that asset? You know, because we're not basically, we're trying not to move the market, that's another challenge. So when you're managing uh, this kind of amount of money, you need to be really careful on the exchanges. Because if you just execute a trade and just burn the market, you would move it or shake it up for like 10, 20%. So what we're doing, we're putting best bid or best ask orders and waiting for them to get fitted. And that's again, like it's taking days sometimes. And you know, people who are not involved in like day-to-day -day operations, they don't even understand that. And like, I'm getting messages like, hey Yuri, like, why is it taking so long? And I'm like, I can't do anything. Like, we're waiting on the exchange. Like, you know, you cannot literally do anything. So that's the problem we're having right now in this industry. So liquidity is a problem. So if someone, a client, let's say, approaches us right now, and he would say, well, can I put, I don't know, like 100 million into your uh, digital asset array? The challenge becomes fitting the orders. Sure, we can do it, but we cannot guarantee you the pricing. You know, we could do it based on the execution price, but not on the current price because, you know, liquidity is simply not there. And then also, you have various different exchanges and API integrations. And the industry is so new that sometimes they just change something. So Binance, 
you guys know Binance, right? It's like biggest exchange right now. So we recently integrated it in January, and at some point it just stopped working. And we were like, what the hell is going on? I'm calling CTO, he's like, I don't know, we need to check. And the thing was that they just changed API, and it just stopped working for us. And no one even informed us about it. So, you know, it's still a very new industry. Uh, we're still like testing things. Uh, we're trying to do it the right way, but it, it's probably just gonna take time. So you have that and then fiat ramp up. That's another thing and another funny story about that. So we had this vision already at the beginning because if you're offering, if you think about our product, we are offering product to people who don't have knowledge about crypto. So they wanna give their money to someone else who's gonna manage it. And um, what you are actually asking them to do is go to the exchange and buy the assets and then transfer them to your platform. So it's like, you know, what the heck? Like they already need to have crypto knowledge in order to do that. So we are targeting a really small segment right now. So what we need is fiat, of course, fiat gateway. So they're just gonna transfer euros, dollars, whatever to your account and um, they're gonna be able to buy with that a basket of digital assets, so basically a diversified portfolio. So everything sounds very simple, yeah? Until you uh, walk into a bank and ask them to open a bank account with which you're gonna be dealing with crypto. Then all of a sudden, they're like, I don't wanna touch that, like, you know, crypto, no. Um, so it's really hard to find banks that are willing to do that. And uh, it was, again, like a long process. So right now, we're probably gonna be able to do it. Um, we're very close, let's hope, fingers crossed, we're gonna do it in a month, um, but we're gonna see. Like the processing, the crypto, sometimes things take way longer than you're expecting them to. So that's a little bit about the challenges that we're facing right now. Um, I won't talk too much about our platform, but maybe just for the end, Oh yeah, and the regulation. So um, when you're talking to clients, everyone wants you to be regulated. Right now, there's no regulation in place. Uh, so, you know, cryptocurrencies in European Union are not defined. So what we are trading on our platform is the same if we would be trading refrigerators or cars. Like, it's just like a commodity. Um, and, you know, when you're talking to regulators, they're not really sure into which uh, segment should they put you and under which regulation. So we are not regulated right now. Our plan is to be regulated. And we are doing a lot of self-regulation. So we are doing KYC. We have two providers, so two different tiers. Tier one, we're using Jumio and tier two ID now where you basically need to have a Skype call with an agent on the other side and they confirm your identity. Um, then the, we're doing anti-money laundering. We're doing, um, so we had big for audit. We have, let's say, professional custody and internal processes and are in talks with the EU regulators. So that's coming as well. Um, but right now, maybe a little bit about the market development. So the market changed a lot since we started the project. So right now, you know, we are supporting on our platform just digital currencies. And those of you who are trading probably are aware of the fact that when Bitcoin is crashing, everything is going down. So on our platform, basically, there's no way you can escape that because there's no fiat. You know, we don't have fiat yet. There's no stable coins on the market that are, let's say, trusted and um, that have enough, big enough volume on the exchanges. Um, so what you can do, like the best thing you can do is exit into Bitcoin. <laughs> but still, you know, Bitcoin went down, what, 70%? So uh, that's one of the things we're ne we need to tackle and we believe that's gonna happen this year. So stable coins right now are emerging. We're probably gonna see that. I already mentioned about platform business. So platform business is also emerging. The regulation is coming. We already heard that today. So probably this year, uh, the space is gonna get regulated. Then custody, there are different solutions getting developed and um, institutional money is starting to float in. So the conversation we are having right now with people are way different than, let's say, a few months ago. So a few months ago, people who were basically just crypto enthusiasts was, were contacting us, but right now institutions started to approach us. So they are aware of the you know, development that is taking place in crypto. 
And for the end, maybe just um, to talk about like average user of our platform, because I think it's really funny. Um, I mean, if you go back, could anyone try and guess like what's the age of average user or average investor in crypto? 25? Yeah, probably something like that. And uh, what's the average, let's say, ticket size? How much they throw in? 20,000? Or $20? Um, 1,000. So the research was done, like, we, we cannot know globally, but the research was done in Netherlands, and I found it fascinating. So what they found out is basically that the average investor in crypto never bought stock. So it's a whole new segment, so my millennials basically, you know, and also a few weeks ago I was in London on a one family office event talking with a guy who's managing um, quite a lot of money and um, he was saying to me, he was like, I don't understand crypto. I knew like something is going on, I want to learn about it because my daughter is investing, but I don't get it. Like, could you explain me? So with that, I could see that, you know, he gets it, like, m millennials are, are using this technology, and that's for the new generation, and probably in the future, when you're gonna say to someone that uh, when it comes to stocks, you needed three days for a settlement if you sold the Japanese stock and bought one in uh, USA, that's gonna be unimaginable for them, because here, everything is instant. Um, so yeah, millennial generation, they invest 1,000 euros or less, they never bought stock, and mostly they heard just about Bitcoin or Ether. So, you know, like when we started building our platform, we thought that when people are going to start investing in crypto, they're going to want to buy a basket of different digital assets. But once they see there's, I don't know, 50 assets that they never heard about, um, I think they get scared. You know, especially because there's a lot of scams, that's like a huge volatility and everything. So we realized right now that the first touch people have with crypto is Bitcoin or Ether. And then in second step, they're going to start diversifying and buying baskets of different cryptocurrencies. Um, so that's all from my side, I think. And right now, um, if you have any questions, I would be more than happy to answer them. Yeah. Great presentation, really cool platform. But, uh, and don't take this the wrong way, what does this have to do with your coin? What? What does all of this have to do with your coin? With, our with ICN, yeah. With ICN? Yeah. Okay, so ICN, yeah, just, just to give you a little bit of background. So when we had ICO, of course, we issued our own token. It's called ICN. And for a long, long time, it had no utility. And everyone was asking us, like, why does your token have no utility? It's, it's useless. But my personal opinion, and I think founders agree with that, because that's why they did it this way, is that if you start building a product like this, and if you predetermine the utility, um, it's a really terrible idea to do that. Because, you know, when we started, we didn't expect the platform to develop in this kind of way. Um, and right now, let's say determining utility right now, it's way better than if we would determine it at the beginning. I'm not sure what would be the utility if we would determine it at the beginning, but right now, um, there are actually fees that are payable in ICN. So what uh, was already announced, with, I think with June, we're gonna start instantly, um, like daily basically, burning the tokens. So we're gonna develop a mechanism, so on a daily basis, we deduct fees from the users. So if you're a user of our platform, let's say you invest into the DEA that is uh, charging 3% management fee, yearly management fee. So 3% divided by 365, that's deducted daily. That's going to the DEA manager as a payment, but we take 30% of it as a platform provider. So that 30% is gonna get transferred into Ether, and then with that Ether, we're gonna be buying ICN and burning it, and with that, the supply of ICN is gonna go down, but with our platform growing, the basically demand for ICN is gonna go up, and we're gonna have a constant buying pressure. And also right now, if you wanna create your own DEA, so before we had um, a minimum seed amount of $100,000 for the creation. 
which is not a cost, it's just this money is needed in order for us to create a base for it. Because imagine what would happen if we just create a structure and um, let's say s you, you invest in that structure, you throw in $5,000. We need to buy those assets that are kind of like the underlying. And when you're exiting, we need to sell the whole position. And because we have 24-7 liquidity, we would need to keep those assets on the exchanges, um, which is, of course, risky. So what we do, basically, we create a base, and we have certain assets, and when you're exiting, we would just give you, let's say that in the structure there's 10% Ethereum, we'll just give you Ethereum from that structure. And then we're going to go on the exchange later on and trade to order in order to balance the portfolio back to the initial weighting. Uh, so yeah, to get back to that. ICN will be used for fees, and also right now, if you're going to open uh, DAA with a smaller seed amount, you're going to need to pay a fee with ICN, and also we offer a possibility to tokenize your digital asset array and issue the tokens. Uh, for, for that, we're going to start charging a fee. Just really quick, and by the way, Anwar didn't ask me to ask any questions, so I'm just doing it voluntarily. Uh, help me understand the connection between, I mean, I know in finance you have initial public offering, and that could be any entity, whether it's a grocery store or a financial institute or whatever. I mean, you can have an initial public offering, you offer your shares to the public. But in the case of ICO, uh, uh, which is initial coin offering, right, does that can this be done to any entity or any business, or it has, there has to be a connection with a business that actually is in the blockchain or uh, cryptocurrency business? J just help me understand the concept of, of, uh, of the ICO. Of the ICO, and so, what kind of businesses that can So offer anyone this, can uh, basically do, do an ICO, but you need to be aware of the fact that you're issuing a token, so your token better has some value. Uh, otherwise, no one's gonna be buying it. I mean, we are lucky at that time, so our token had no utility, but people were still buying it. But those were, you know, days of the Wild West. At that time, raising money was different than right now. So right now, if there would be an ICO with a token that has no utility, and someone will ask me, like, do you want to throw in 100K? I would go, like, hell no. Like, I'm not throwing any. Like, because... You know, token mechanics is really important. So you need to have some mechanism in place in order for the value to go up and to appreciate. And for us, that's burning the tokens, basically. So the supply goes down, and the demand for the token goes up while the platform is growing. You know, so the investors can see that the token's going to appreciate over time. But then, on the other hand, you have a few tokens on the market. I won't go specifically and I mention the names. But some tokens don't have any real utility and they're useless it's just pure speculation but yeah otherwise any company could basically have an ICO any other question yeah uh, have any um, any institution and I went have used the social network as a platform for crypto if anyone can use our platform. No, no, the social platform, the social ne uh, network, media, like uh, using, uh, I don't know, Instagram or all of these things. Can, it, can it be a, a good platform? Because it, like, there's uh, millions of people on this platform. It's just a social, social platform. This yeah. also can be used to exchange crypto, right? So that uh, with Instagram, people would be exchanging crypto. Yeah, why not? Yeah, at some point, maybe. If this becomes, a f like, say, an exchange of value, you mm -hmm. know, you could maybe use a platform like that to basically uh, send cryptos to other. But how our platform differs is that we have a platform for asset management. So it's not like a, a social thing where you talk with friends, post pictures. You know, you just go there, you invest, you come a week later to the platform, you check what's going on with your portfolio. Because um, yeah, I heard there's a, there's a game, uh, like um, a video game or whatever you call it. Is, is it a, a coin called Kin? Uh, okay. It's not too popular, but it's uh, gaining momentum. 
So that's not liquidity is low, but it's within the gaming community. Yeah. It is. I think sometimes. gaming is going to be big when it comes to crypto. Like you can you can already see that a lot of companies who are involved with um, gaming. That's actually a South Korean company. I think it's called Nexon. Uh, so they're trying. There's a rumor. I, I'm not sure if it's true, but there's a rumor that they are trying to buy the um, crypto exchange with the longest history. It's a Slovenian exchange called Bitstamp. Um, you guys probably know it. Uh, so it's basically the only exchange that is still around and um, was founded in 2011. And they're trying to buy it. So a gaming company, you know. Any other questions? Yes. So um, is there a date time as for when economy users can start exchanging fiat for cryptocurrencies? We don't have a specific date because as I said before, like it's mostly, most like the biggest part is not on us, it's on banks. So let's say within a few weeks. So we're talking weeks, not months anymore. I hope within a month that's gonna be possible, but at first we're gonna start accepting just bigger deposit. It's probably it's gonna be $50,000 or more because you know in crypto space you don't know what's gonna hit you. So we saw what's gonna, what was happening in let's say December or early January. I know for Bitstamp because I have some, I mean I know some people who are working there and I know that uh, there are such a big demand for cryptocurrencies that they had a waiting time for like three or four weeks for account approval. They had 600,000 people uh, waiting for their account to get verified, you know, and we're not sure what's going to happen if we open fiat. Maybe we're going to get 10,000 transactions in a day. Maybe we're going to get 10. Like, who knows? So we're going to start with bigger ones, and then if we're going to be able to handle 50k or more, then we're going to lower to 45 and we're gonna be able to handle that, we're gonna lower. You know, we also need to build like the whole department. If you're thinking about the payment processes, it seems pretty simple, but basically you need a department for that um, to check, you know, if everything is correct. Um, because only you can transfer the assets for your account. So if my mom would, let's say, transfer assets from her bank account to my economy account, we should not accept that. And you know, all those mechanisms need to be in place and you need to check that if it's, everything is fine, if it's not, you need to give them a call. So a lot of, a lot of work. Um, so we're gonna gradually be lowering that, but our goal is to basically accept any deposit, even like $100, you know. And for the buy-in right now, the minimum is $10, but in crypto assets. So $10 is the minimum. Thank you. Yeah, any other questions? No? Okay, thank you.